Hello and welcome to On Point. I'm Ava Lang. In a snap of a finger, COVID-19 erased three decades of gains by women in the workplace. It's led to what experts call not a recession, but a she-session. When the pandemic first started last March, Labor Department statistics show more than 3 million women were forced out of the workforce. Since then, about 2 million women have returned to work. Still, the last time there were this few American women in the workforce was 1987. There are many reasons why women were more vulnerable to the shock. Research shows that in heterosexual couples, mothers perform about 60% of childcare, suggesting the expectation of childcare lies with them, according to the organization First Five LA. Business Insider reports about 70% of single parents are mothers. Many whose jobs didn't offer paid leave had to choose between working and caring for their children. So how was this she session born? Let's take a look at our panel. First, we have Hema Zamaro. Hema is an economist at the University of Arkansas and USC Center of Economic and Social Research. Next, we have Evan Jackson, the owner of Young, Bold, and Regal Media Company. This company highlights black women and women of color in the arts, entertainment, and entrepreneurship. Lastly, we have Chelsea Alford, the owner of The Slay Room and a single mother working during the pandemic. Hema, let's start with you. What does the term she session originally come from? It comes from the fact that we see that this pandemic has been affecting women much harder than men in the labor market. And that's a very different from other crises, economic crises that we saw before. So we see this crisis is affecting more um, with the with the uh, uh, social distancing measures is affecting much more work that are more female dominated. If you think of the sectors of like service, like things like restaurants, hotels, the men. So we saw that many more women, especially minorities, uh, women have been hit really hard and that's something new. So the new term, it comes from that. Has there ever been a time in history where gender equality had taken such a big step back? To my knowledge, no. I don't think we have seen, like I said, previous economic crises affected more manufacturing, construction that are more male dominated. And this, this one I think is unique because of the sectors it affects and also because with the school closures and daycare closures, we have seen also an increase on childcare mm -hmm. responsibilities that had fallen more in women. So I, I think it's really unique and has affected women much more. Right. Um, Evan, you work with a lot of actors, especially women of color. How are they doing during the pandemic? It's been really tough um, having personal conversations with them and um, talking with them on my platform, Young, Bold, and Regal, about staying afloat, especially the back and forth of uh, closures when it comes to movies and television in the middle of 2020. So they had to do odd jobs, they had to pick up a new skill in order to get by until the next um, production. Could you tell me a little bit more about your business? Yeah, Young, Bold, and Regal is my entertainment outlet media company. So we feature Black women and women of color in the fields of the arts, entertainment, and entrepreneurship. So pre-COVID, we would be on the red carpet covering events, covering ch charity galas, covering women-centered events. And then in COVID, we focus more on virtual events. Um, and, you know, the crisis I know is affecting a lot of the women you work with. Why do you think it's affecting women more than men? Um, looking at it, it looks like disproportionately it's geared towards um, women in the, the she session. Honestly, because I think it's the confidence of the people giving out those investments, giving out those jobs, giving out those opportunities. So I don't know if it's necessarily an inherent bias. But um, I just read on, on, the, on the Harvard Business Review, talked about 2.3% of the women's businesses um, got the money from venture capitalists. So venture capitalists are people with really big money. They give out the big investments. And 2.3%, I feel like that's unfair. So I feel like that needs to be fixed. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, Chelsea, how did the pandemic affect your family? It affected my family drastically because it came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, I had to scramble to try to find something 
for my child to do to stay active, for him to continue his education. Um, and even more importantly, you know, bills. I had bills that were that were piling up. So it was like I needed to proactively get into something um, to, 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 I guess, would say stay afloat. Hence me coming up with my business, The Slave Room, um, because I've always heard, you know, you should have multiple streams of income, but it didn't actually affect me until the pandemic hit. And I was like, okay, well, I guess it's time to put this into play. Um, so the, the pandemic affected me in a lot of different ways. Um, and it, it affected my son as well, because it was something new that we've never, none of us have ever experienced. Could you tell me a little bit about what you do? Yes, absolutely. So prior to COVID, I was a beauty recruiter um, and I ended up taking that all into effect. You know, as a single mother, it was hard thinking of ways to come up with income. So I started my business called The Slay Room and basically it's to build confidence in every single person who, was, who buys a product from me. Um, I do sell lashes, uh, accessories, clothes, basically all products that will give you some type of confidence when you walk into whatever room that you're going into. So it's basically a confidence builder type of business that I have going on. You know, you're a single working parent. What kind of help did you need from the government during the pandemic? I think mainly just some type of assistance money wise, mm -hmm. um, because it was becoming a little detrimental when, you know, we were trying to figure out groceries when we were trying, you know, we're home more. So it's probably going to be a little bit more meals than usual. Um, I had to get back to work sometime. So I, I needed some type of assistance when it came to childcare. That mm -hmm. was important, mainly, mainly, you know, my day-to-day -day bills and childcare was very important. And that's mm -hmm. that's the assistance that I mainly needed from the government. I think while we're on that topic, uh, Hema, childcare in this country is um, kind of a mess, I guess we could say. Uh, childcare workers are poorly paid and childcare is very expensive. And then now more than ever, childcare slots are really limited. What do you think that we should do about that? Like you say, this is a problem that we have had for a long time. I think the pandemic is just showing us how big of the problem it is. So I think to move forward, I think what has happened is first, yes, because we were trying to contain the virus, um, schools were closed, daycare centers were closed. And um, then they started reopening and they are starting reopening. So the first thing, I think that's a good thing that we are moving hopefully with vaccines, we can start moving forward on that front. But also I think in particular daycare centers, they need, like you said, they had already people working there have, um, have lower salaries, but also they have higher costs. So I think um, what I see other countries is that a lot of child, most of the childcare is privately funded in this country in comparison with other countries I come from Europe, where there is much more investment of the government. And I think now more than ever, they will need it because they need to invest on, they need more people, right? They need to have smaller groups to try to, until this pandemic is under control, they will need, they needed more supplies, they needed to clean things, they needed more toys because things cannot be shared. So the cost has gone up. So I think moving forward, we need a bigger investment to realize that raising kids should be not just an individual family problem, it's good for humankind. So we should all realize that and invest on our families and especially childcare centers and schools in general. Yeah, you bring up some really good points. Uh, what do you think the government or city officials ha could have done to prevent this challenge? Uh, this is for Hema, if you wouldn't mind further elaborating on this. Money. I think a, better, a bigger investment uh, to try to help them because I think what we are seeing is that many had to close because temporarily they had to close, but they still have to pay the rent for their mm -hmm. places. They have to get, in, in, if they were going to reopen, to make more investments and get uh, more things. So, uh, in, so I think 
Um, now a big investment for them to, if they had to close, to be able to reopen and then uh, helping with those expenses so they can really uh, um, provide their service. Hema, are there any programs in place uh, to help mothers and children out? There are plans to provide some monetary help for families, uh, which I think it will be welcome. But I think, and there are plans, but I, uh, I think it has not happened yet, but it's hopefully coming. There are plans for making these infrastructure investments in schools and in, in daycare centers. So hopefully we see, um, my hope is that with everything that we want, went through, as I said, these are problems that have been there for a long time, but now they are so much in our face that it's, you know, I'm hopeful that with our new government, we, these plans will be coming to effect. Chelsea, were there any programs that were helpful for you or maybe any of your friends? Well, I didn't start seeing, surprisingly, I didn't start seeing programs until the beginning of this year. Um, you know, like Hema said, everything was shut down, which was, very scary for a while because it's like okay even if I wanted to try to go back out and get some type of work I can't because I don't really have you know stuff opening uh for my child but um I I started seeing more things in the mail come out like February um and in March basically saying like we have child care there were some programs that were assisting of course COVID safe program. So they were only, they were very limited um, amounts of students that they could take in uh, or kids that they can take in. Um, but as far as programs, you know, they, I, I believe they're starting to create more. They're starting mm -hmm. to create more, more programs in the area. Also, depending on what your area is and how open, how more of how open it is. Um, uh, depending on like states in California, they do have uh, they do have a center where you can reach out and ask for government assistance along with um, you know getting child care as well. So they it's like a back to work program. Um, so it does help you out in that type of sense. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are, there are some programs that that I've seen um, to help out with child care. Wonderful, um, Evan. I wonder if you have an opinion about this, since you're on the spot as the man. Um, why do you think fathers are not staying at home and instead it's the mothers? I think um, that's looked at, at it as uh, traditionally, mm -hmm. but obviously um, we've gotten away from that traditional, that tradition because, you know, women are more in the workforce, but mm -hmm. the brunt of focus of childcare is still on them as well. So they have to go out and, and work and they also have to take care of the child. And during COVID, I'm sure that was incredibly and extremely difficult. And you talked about, are there um, certain programs in California or across the country? Um, there's a program by Nefertiri Plessy called the Single Moms Planet. It's a platform, but also she gives opportunities to pay for a car service for a single mother or pay for something to, lessen the burden on single mothers. So I think that um, venture capitalists, I think that economists working at the top, I think people who are doling and giving out these um, grants, um, investments, they should take a better look at it because we can't rely on, on what we think of traditionally. We have to uh, rely on, on the new and for the future and factor in women in the workforce as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now we are going to play a video from Marcella Badillo, the activities director at local charter school and a mother of a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. So I think initially it was really exciting to think about like exiting out the commute to get to work and getting to see my children every single day um, for long extended periods of the day. But I wasn't considering that my children only see me as mom. They don't know my role at work. They don't care about my role at work. So it's really difficult to manage both things when, you know, kids are just kids and they're just going to see me as mom. We have a lot of roles. So it's just, it was like, it felt like it was a nonstop duty, like a job that you can never check out of. You were just like constantly going and there was no, no real like end in sight, you know, in your job, you're able to like check out 
And so when you leave to go to work, you feel like you're getting a little bit of break from your kids and you're going into your next role. But in this setting, it's, there's no break for mom. I actually have friends that had ha had to stop working. I'm one of the few, I think, that continued to work and, you know, be a mom here at, at home because I had friends that just couldn't do both. You know, there wasn't an option for them to continue working. And so it was either continue to come to work or stay with your kids and, and help them do school. Chelsea, I felt like you were resonating with that video a bit. Um, what are your reflections from that? I felt literally every single word that she said only because like, I wear many hats in my household. Um, and mom is the only hat that my that my kids ever see me really wear. My kid doesn't really see me when I work. So I definitely agree with the fact of her saying like, you know, those two worlds sort of clash. Um, I was that friend that was not able to work during COVID. So I had to figure out the next steps, you know, for my household. Um, I literally resonated with every single word that she said the entire time it wasn't one thing where she was where she missed it i mean you know you miss your kids you start off at first like okay let me look at the positive of COVID, and the positive is we're going to spend more time together but the con on top of that is you're now a, you're now a full-time teacher you're responsible for your kids education you know you have to you have to set up you're you're a full-time teacher you're an it person you have to set up the the computer the internet and if anything goes wrong you have to step in you know you you have to cook, you have to clean, you have to make sure that they're fed, you know, we have to make sure that they're still being active because they're not just sitting around playing games all day. Like it's a lot that goes into um, that position during that tough time. And then on top of that, in the back of your head, you still have to do what's best for you and, you know, figure out how you're going to get more money and the stress of trying to stay healthy. Like all of that took a toll on uh, individual who mm -hmm. you know is strictly just a parent at when you know when it was regular a parent and then you go to work and you're doing whatever your your nine to five is so it it was stressful but we got through it and you know it, it was it was rough but I, I I definitely agree with everything that she said um Hema do you have anything to add about the video yeah so I'm also a mom of two mm -hmm. kids um you saw one I me. saw one yeah <laughs> right now so I'm yeah it, it was really difficult it was really difficult I think um I mean in my research we have been looking at how um, even um, the two parent households how they are dividing the work and um and we saw that I mean, before the pandemic already, women were doing more. And then with the pandemic, women were doing even more. And I think that like, we discussed might be because of gender roles. I also think, yeah, I don't know. We are like, we just do it. Yeah. And I think when you are on it, you just do it. But uh, it has consequences. If it, 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 it might have consequences for our careers, mm -hmm. definitely. The way I did it, it was working less hours, working all the time, working at any time. Like the video says, you have no break because you are either teaching your kids or you are the mom or you are working. Yeah. Um, and and they definitely had another thing we see in my research is that it had a consequence in terms of mental health mm. for mothers. So symptoms of anxiety and depression grew really, really high, especially at the beginning of the pandemic and much more. I mean, the group that was more affected was mothers. So mm -hmm. that already tells you that I think, yeah, we figure out how we can and we go through it, but it's having consequences on us and also on the kids because mm -hmm. yeah, if parents are not fine, the kids also have their consequences. Right. Um, Evan, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think um, gender roles and the tradition, traditional thought of that is really um, probably driving the system of how the money is dispersed for investments. Mm -hmm. And you have certain statistics like 70% uh, of high school, or high school valedictorians are women, are young girls. And they will grow up to be leading their own startup, having their own businesses. So how we disperse that money is equally as important as 
getting that money. I feel like we need to localize it to certain groups, especially when it comes to single mothers, especially when it comes to single mothers that are struggling with the business. Evan, I know um, I know you work with a, a lot of women of color and entertainment. What are the long-term consequences of not responding to this issue? The long-term consequences are the fact that those women of color and Black women are left out of the loop when it comes to the investments, when it comes to investing in them. And that's going, going to hurt Hollywood in the long run. I feel like Hollywood overall has been doing a good job, but I feel like it needs to do a better job because it's not a, it's not the deal that you see at the top. It's the dispersion across the money. And um, obviously Hollywood is different from the government, but still um, those black women, those women of color still deserve that uh, budget you would give to uh, another group. And I feel like the long-term effects of that is that um, those women get X'd out of Hollywood and mm -hmm. you want more inclusion and you want more diversity in Hollywood. So you need that from journalism. You need that in the fields of journalism, entertainment journalism, executives, directors, cinematographers, filmmakers. So all, all, all of the above. Chelsea, um, I know that the there's all this discussion of reopening schools and why that will happen. Um, do you think that that will provide some solution or could that create new problems? I'm a little bit on the fence. So I feel like it's good socially for kids to get back into school and be around their peers. And because I feel like COVID, uh, the pandemic definitely took a toll on a lot of kids' social skills. But at the same time, health-wise, which health is more important, I don't know if it's if it's the smartest thing to just push them back into school so soon. Um, a lot of the they're, they're saying, you know, May first, they want to make sure all teachers and all staff are vaccinated. That probably should have been done before they start opening back up schools, mm -hmm. in my personal opinion. I would much rather everybody to be fully vaccinated before you start letting kids in, because then I feel like it's a never ending cycle of, you know, well, this person got their vaccination last Friday, but everybody else got theirs a month ago. Like it's it's still sort of playing Russian roulette with with people's health, with like people's lives. Um, so I personally feel like, you know, once it's fully cleared or once, you know, there's more of a, of a um, like prominent s scenario for, for kids to be welcome back in, then yeah, of course, definitely, you know, bring everybody back in. I personally feel like August would be the best time because you have the entire summer. You can still, you know, they're still working out things with the vaccine, um, but, you know, give it some time, make sure it settles, make sure everybody's up to par with their with their vaccinations and then open it back up and have students come in fully. Hema, um, what families are being affected the most? Is there a common denominator? Yeah, so definitely African-American women and Hispanic um, women within all families I have been hit harder in terms of losing more jobs uh, I think childcare, we all have been affected, but also um, I think on average, uh, white families have jobs that allow them, like me, to work from home. So, you you know, it's still very hard. So I can only imagine for people who cannot do that. But uh, the flexibility allows you to kind of figure it out because you work other times. Uh, um, so I think in, in terms of just like insecurity, in terms of income, job loss, food insecurity, and then just from the, the pandemic itself, we have seen how minorities have been hit harder. So that's specifically a group that has been a, especially hit. Hema, do you think that employers have to change the way they operate in order to accommodate working parents? I hope so. I think. It, and I, my hope is that I'm trying to see what is the positive of going through this. So again, my hope is that now we realize more than ever all the problems that we had. I, I'm trying to say maybe this is the positive of everything we are going through. Maybe, you know, there is a possibility to start over. And I think one positive 
that I starting to see is that employers are realizing the family life that is behind and the work that women do behind. And now, you know, kids show up in the Zoom, so it's really there. So sometimes employers are seeing for the first time how people people's lives are and the other responsibilities. So um, I think uh, um, hopefully we move to a situation where there is more understanding and there is more flexibility in terms of hours or working from home when needed. I hope there is more support for family leave also within employers. Um, I have seen a little bit of change towards that direction and I think that's hopeful that uh, more investment on family realizing that they have sometimes they might need to take time off and it's okay to pay them that time off because then they come back and they, they stay with us and they stay with employer and they are more productive. Evan, do you have any hope within this issue? I, I do. I feel like there is, um, I feel like things are coming back. Um, people's eyes are more open to disenfranchised groups, um, especially when it comes to minorities, especially when it comes to women in certain ethnic groups. And I feel like people are taking action on their own. They're not waiting for the government. If they want to contact somebody, they write a letter or they're very vocal about it, or they raise money on their own to give to that, um, to give to that particular business. So I feel like there is a lot of hope, but I feel like we need hope with action and um, hope with positive action moving forward. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you everyone for sharing your knowledge about She Session. This was an honor to get to be able to speak to you. I'm Ava Lang and it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Did you make the transfer to Hong Kong for the Emerson Project? I was just about to, but did you see the boss's email? It doesn't look right. It looked fine to me. I don't remember him mentioning the Emerson Project in our last week. The bank in Hong Kong closes in 15 minutes. Make the transfer. Yes, sir. Night's on the way. Mr. Jacobs, just transferred the money for the Emerson Project. What Emerson Project? Don't be that guy. Trust, but verify. Thank you for watching On Point. You can watch us on LA 36 Santa Clarita Valley Television. You can listen to us on KCSN 88.5 FM on Sunday morning and follow us on social media at CSUN On Point. For all of us at On Point, I'm Ava Lang.